So you're interested in the Sony ZV-E10 because the Sony FX3 is too big for vlogging and now you're confused between the ZV-1 and ZV-E10. Thus, you're here because you either want a pretty quick answer on why you should or should not consider this camera before spending more time researching or you have watched multiple reviews on this and just want to make sure you're not missing out on anything else before making that purchase. Well, welcome to my channel, don't forget to subscribe and here's 5 things you should know about the Sony ZV-E10 before considering or buying. Both the ZV-1 and the ZV-E10 are Sony's vlog range cameras. They basically fall a step below the cinema line FX cameras made by Sony and so what that means is you get a huge bump in video recording features compared to cameras in its price range such as autofocus, product showcase features and zero crop 4K recording or 120fps at 1080p, stuff like that. But you do lose out on features like electronic viewfinders for example. I am hoping that people watching this video already knew this but if not, these cameras are best suited to vloggers and video content creators in general based on the features I just explained. They are probably the best beginners friendly vlogging cameras out there with the ZV-1 the easiest of the two as it comes fitted with a lens like a compact camera does. And well it's also smaller as the ZV-E10 needs to make space for the interchangeable lens tech. So if you're someone that's starting out as a vlogger, the ZV-1 is more than fine. More about this on point 5, so just don't rush to conclusions yet. While the ZV-E10 is for more versatile needs. For example, if you want to use it as a vlogging camera and shoot b-rolls of a product you're reviewing and then connect it to your Elgato cam link for streaming with a face cam, the ZV-E10 is probably your best choice. Like that literally shows 3 examples where you would need 3 different lenses. Something you can't exactly do with the ZV-1. Well, you can, but quality would be an issue. You see, the ZV-1 has a 1 inch sensor and smartphones have a smaller sensor than that. However, the interchangeable lens tech in the ZV-E10 uses Sony's E-mount tech, thus it gets the minimum requirement industry standard APS-C sensor. This is nearly twice the size of the 1 inch and 10 times the size of an average high end smartphone like the iPhone 12. So why does this matter? Well, I'm not going to bore you with all the physics and all the tech on this, but well, lenses are a circle, but the output you get is a rectangle and this rectangle is based on the sensor. A 1 inch sensor, okay this is probably a bit confusing, I should have mentioned this before, it isn't actually 1 inch. It's named as 1 inch after some video camera tube thing, I'm not sure about that, but anyways, this sensor takes the image it can from the light coming to the entire lens as illustrated. Now APS-C sensor is bigger and while the bigger interchangeable lens means it takes a larger image. So if everything else about the two lenses are the exact same apart from the size, then basically you get a wider field of view and thus more data. And well if you zoom the larger lens in to match the output of the smaller sensor, well, the larger sensor in that camera also gets more megapixels, thus better quality in images and better dynamic range and color. However, this is the case only if you get the right lenses. And the kit lens the ZV-10 comes with, well, it's good, but it's not much of an improvement over the ZV-1. So if you plan to stick with the kit lens, you might as well just get the ZV-1. Sources for all the things I've just said there and review links are in the description especially if you're not sure what I'm saying is right or wrong and unfortunately I can only do this with the specs for now but if you don't forget to subscribe it will improve my chances to bring you guys my own benchmarks and hands on reviews to back the claims I make instead of relying on other sources and reviewers for images and footages as well. So hit that big red button before continuing. So if you're now sure that you want the ZV-E10 over the ZV-1, you might want to think about the lens options. Ideally, you probably want the kit lens as a base because it's only $100 premium. Most of us, well, I would personally get the kit lens as the base anyways. But I can't exactly suggest you the exact lenses after that. I have linked in the description a video on it if you want to know more about the types of lenses you want to get. The three best options for example. Obviously you can do your research from there. What you have to know is that the APS-C sensor is smaller than the full frame. Thus, you can fit both the types of lenses. Just remember, full frame lenses are more expensive and there will be a 1.5x crop factor if you fit a lens onto a camera with an APS-C sensor. You just have to be a bit wary of that. Also, keep wary of the aperture as ideally, you want a f4 for daylight and outdoor stuff and a f1.8 or f2.8 for indoors for darker places or for bokeh, also known as background defocus as well. You know, to blur out the background without the need for any software. 
cameras like the ZV E10 do get image stabilization. But well, if you have gone to other reviews already, you would have realized by now that they aren't as good as iPhones or other smartphones. This is because the ZV E10 does not get optical image stabilization and relies on an electronic one, unless you get a lens with OSS on it. There are only a few lenses that can use Sony's optical stabilization and you might not like the aperture on it or the uh, focal length options on it. There are a lot of compromises you might have to make. However, all of this is actually an easy fix if you use software. So by installing Catalyst Browser on your PC, you can take the footage and stabilize it yourself. And it would be way better than any inbuilt system on your phone or camera, albeit a small crop. You can also use Adobe Premiere Pro and that's the whole point because if you have a camera, you're most likely going to use uh, the software on your PC to stabilize the footage, which is why, well, um, you don't exactly need to worry about this. Speaking of iPhones, you see the Zephy E10 is 799 US dollars, similarly priced in, in, um, in other countries as well, when you add taxes and stuff. And this is with the kit lens. While an iPhone is about $1,099 in US, you can find a similar price difference in other countries when you add taxes and stuff. So the Zephy E10 is way cheaper, but obviously it's not a phone. The iPhone is obviously more usable every day because it's a phone, but it's not a camera. The same goes for smartphones with similar or better camera tech to the iPhone. So here's the thing, if you're looking to upgrade from your iPhone, the Zephy E10 is probably the best option out there. If you're just starting out, the iPhone is more than enough. And well, if you don't own one, then get the Zephy one and then upgrade to the Zephy E10 later in the future. For a beginner, it's just so much easier to start with the Zephy one, especially considering you won't be changing lenses and doing all that stuff once you start it. So just keep that in mind. Well, hope I persuaded or dissuaded you from the Sony Zephy E10. Don't hesitate to comment if there was any mistakes or if I missed anything. A hands-on review done by myself would be great, but with 113 subs, they ain't giving me a test piece. So boost that sub count if you're interested in this and want a hands-on version with benchmarks and stuff. Also tap the bell icon and I will be back. Oh,